This talk is a, a little different to uh, some of the others that uh, you've heard in this series. Um, so here, if you imagine a Venn diagram of talk types, uh, so it's got at least uh, these three sets, research, popular, math, education. And I think most of the talks uh, in this series have been in the research set here. Um, this one is definitely in this part of the Venn diagram. Um, so a couple of months ago, um, I gave a, a short talk about uh, mathematics and art in Africa in another setting. And uh, Jared, I heard about this and uh, perhaps rashly asked me to do something similar for this seminar. Um, so I was a little hesitant. Jared uh, assured me that uh, it was okay that this is outside the, the complement, that this is in the complement of the research part of this diagram. So with that assurance, um, I agreed to do this. Um, but so broadly speaking, uh, this talk is about uh, the intersection of visual arts and mathematics. Um, and of course, there are many examples across uh, many different cultures of decorative arts um, with distinctive mathematical aspects. Uh, to name some uh, well-known examples, there's of course the tilings in Islamic art, nowhere better exemplified than in the tiles at the Alhambra. There's uh, Celtic knots. Uh, there's basketry from many cultures. Um, and I think uh, these examples are striking uh, for at least two reasons. Um, first of all, I think they illustrate that uh, mathematical principles, even if they're not explicitly articulated, are deeply ingrained and universal. <clears throat> but I think they also show the uh, power of mathematics. I mean, in all these examples, there's clearly some kind of order or structure, but uh, it may be difficult to capture it with just words. And uh, mathematics provides an extremely effective language for describing this order. So, um, I mean, my goals uh, for this talk, they're really two. And the, the first is uh, just to illustrate both these aspects that I just mentioned through a few examples from Africa. <clears throat> so, I mean, in other words, it's simply an excuse to enjoy some beautiful African decorative arts from a mathematical perspective. Um, but the second uh, goal of the talk is to describe how these and other examples can be used as a basis for a serious math course. Um, and uh, I mean, this part is more than just hypothetical. It, it really grew out of a proposal for a course that I'm planning to teach um, in the master's program at the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences in South Africa, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, you, you may ask why I'm focusing on Africa and why the particular examples that I want to show you. And uh, I mean, really the best answers that I can give are, first of all, I was born and grew up in South Africa and thus acquired a special affection for things African. Um, and secondly, I mean, these are examples that uh, for one reason or another, I happen to have come across and uh, which I hope you'll agree are aesthetically appealing. So it's nice to have an excuse to stop and enjoy them. But uh, I mean, in other words, there's really something random about the examples that I'm gonna show you. There are many other equally compelling instances of this interaction between art and math that one can find in African and many other cultures. Uh, this is really a, a very rich vein that we're mining here. Um, just before we begin, I should add that um, while I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share these examples with you, you might argue that I'm perhaps not the best, uh, the, not the person best suited to tell this story. I mean, for one thing, I'm definitely not an expert in art appreciation or African culture. Um, I mean, on those fronts, I can't claim to be anything more than an enthusiastic admirer. Um, and I hope you, you'll find that my enthusiasm will make up for my lack of other qualifications in that. Uh, I'm on slightly more solid ground for the second part of the talk, which is about using these examples um, as a basis for a math course. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm planning such a course uh, for the master's program at, a at Ames. So some of you may already know about Ames. I think there may even be some Ames alumni in the audience here. Um, but if you don't know about the Ames organization, uh, I strongly encourage you to go to their website um, or to talk to someone who's spent some time at one of these institutes. Um, 
they run a one-year master's program, uh, which is divided into three weeks blocks in which uh, students take a um, wide uh, range of courses in math and related subjects. And in many of these, the general mathematical tools and modes of thought are as important as the specific content. Um, so the curriculum can accommodate a wide variety of topics. Um, I myself have been uh, several times to Ames in both South Africa and Rwanda, and I've taught two courses there, one on curves in the plane and one on the topology um, and geometry of surfaces. And now I'm working with Ames to develop a third course based on the interaction between art and math. Um, and that's sort of what I wanted to, part of what I wanted to describe today. Uh, so my plan is to show you um, three different examples of decorative arts or practices from African culture where math plays a role. Um, all of them uh, display an order that uh, we'd want to describe as symmetry, um, though in the third example, we'll see some unexpected other mathematical ideas also enter. But so um, let me perhaps begin with the idea of symmetry. So, uh, I mean, among the first questions you might ask are, well, what exactly is it? And what is it about symmetry that we find appealing? Uh, <clears throat> so we'll see that mathematics is very good at formulating an answer to the question, at least in a very precise something to think deserves the name symmetry. The second is perhaps a harder one for us, uh, but beyond the reach of mathematics, one of the mathematicians uh, who showed how to answer the first question uh, was Herman Weil, and he had this to say about the second aspect, it's symmetry as wide or as narrow as you may define its meaning is one idea by which man through the ages has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty, and perfection. So here's uh, one striking example of the impact that symmetry has on us. Uh, so here it's described by William Blake as uh, the fearful symmetry of a tiger. Uh, so I hope the symmetry in my examples is somewhat less fearsome than this, but I think no less profound. So our first example, <clears throat> uh, in the Bailey wall decorations, comes from South Africa. So the, uh, the population in South Africa is, uh, is a mix of many different groups. And this is illustrated by the fact that the country has uh, 11 official languages, including nine African languages. Um, so one of these is in Dibeli, and this is spoken as a first language today by about one and a half million people. Um, today, I wanna to focus on one distinctive aspect of Ndebele culture, namely the tradition of wall decorations. Uh, entirely freehand with very rudimentary brushes, often just birds. <clears throat> um, say that uh, many of the images that I've included here come from uh, the work of photographer Margaret Courtney Clark, who uh, documented this in the bed house painting nicely. Um, as you can see, uh, not a decoration strikingly colorful, but they're highly geometric and structured. Um, last aspect is where math comes in. So let me just show you a couple of examples. So uh, in this example, you see that uh, there's a vertical line of reflection here. Um, so if, you know, if, you, if the line is drawn as shown, then ignoring the colors, the part of the mural to the left is a perfect mirror image of the part on the right. Um, in this uh, second example, there's even more going on. Uh, for example, uh, in each of the panels on this wall, you can see there are two lines of reflection, one vertical and one horizontal. There's also um, a symmetry under 180 degree rotation. If you rotate the whole, each panel through 180 degrees around uh, its center point, the, the pattern returns to itself. In uh, the horizontal strips uh, along the top and along the bottom of the pattern, uh, you can see a different kind of order. If uh, you imagine extending the pattern indefinitely so that 
the part shown is you know, just one small portion. Now, if you take this infinite freeze pattern and shift everything by the distance between the diamonds uh, that I've indicated with the arrow over there, you'll find, uh, again, ignoring the colors, that the pattern sort of returns to itself. And we'll say more about this uh, in the next example. But so I think you know, it's, it's clear that the Indebelli mural artists have a sophisticated understanding of certain principles of order that we would colloquially call symmetry. And they're very adept at using it to create, in uh, Herman Weil's words, order, beauty, and perfection. Um, but so how do we describe these features more precisely? So uh, one way of formulating really what's the, what is the fundamental insight um, is nicely expressed here by uh, physicist Richard Feynman, uh, who said that um, a thing is symmetrical if one can subject it to a certain operation and it appears exactly the same after the operation. Uh, so in the context of the Indebelli murals, um, we can translate this <clears throat> into precise mathematics um, as follows. So everything takes place um, on uh, a flat surface, the wall. So mathematically, this is uh, the plane R2. Um, the decorations um, or the painting on the wall, this is the thing in Feynman's description, is, makes up some subset of the plane. The operations we described, um, the reflections in, in a mirror or rotations about a line or a shift, are physical rearrangements. And what's special about these is that uh, they don't distort shapes or geometric relationships. Um, so the mathematical term for this, for such an operation is an isometry, and I'll say more about this in a minute. Um, so for each operation, for each, op uh, each isometry, uh, we can now say precisely what it means for the painting to have that symmetry defined by such an isometry. So it means that um, when S is applied to the whole wall, uh, it, uh, the operation leaves the painting invariant. So uh, this mathematical description is obviously full of jumping off points for further investigation. So material for a serious math course. So let me um, unpack that a little bit. <clears throat> uh, so uh, before we can define uh, geometry preserving operations, we need to make sense of geometry. Um, and here we obviously mean familiar Euclidean geometry, which can be introduced in two ways. Uh, the synthetic or axiomatic approach, including of course the notorious fifth postulate or you can take a more analytic uh, approach based on a coordinatized plane with a Euclidean metric um, and de defined in terms of the differential geometry of curves. Um, so uh, there are several directions that you could go in a course from here, uh, including introducing non-Euclidean geometries based on alternatives to the parallel postulate uh, so that means uh, hyperbolic or spherical geometry. Uh, taking the analytic approach, uh, you can go into a deeper investigation of differential geometry of curves and surfaces, introduce metrics and geodesics and curvature, um, or the differential geometry of manifolds. Um, going back to uh, the Euclidean geometry, there's a lot you can say about operations which preserve all the features of Euclidean geometry, in other words, about isometries. So first working entirely within synthetic geometry, you can easily identify three basic isometries. There's a translation, um, there's a reflection across a line, um, there's a rotation around a fixed point, um, and all of these appear in our Indebelli example. So uh, less obviously, but uh, perhaps somewhat amazingly, um, you can show that um, any isometry is equivalent to a composition of one, two, or at most three reflections. And furthermore, that apart from the three that we've already identified, there's only one other sort that's called a glide reflection, which is a combination of a translation and a reflection about a horizontal line along the direction of the translation. 
taking a more analytic approach, you can introduce a whole host of important ideas in a course here. Um, first of all, since isometries can be composed to form new isometries, the set of all of them forms a group um, that are called yeah, isometries of R2. It's not just a group, but uh, <clears throat> it's a Lie group. <clears throat> So this, of course, opens uh, the door to an entire course, uh, but confining ourselves for now uh, to just the particular Lie group that uh, we were, we're talking about, the isometry group of the plane, this already gives us plenty to investigate. Um, for instance, uh, you can see that uh, the translations form a normal subgroup, uh, and that up to a translation, all isometries are orthogonal linear transformations. Uh, and with just a little bit more work, you can introduce the idea of a semi-direct product and actually fully describe the isometry group um, for Euclidean geometry as this semi-direct product. So, I mean, this in itself is perhaps a, a, a nice high point for a course, but um, it's also now an opportunity to uh, introduce an idea which drastically changes our view of geometry in a, in a very fruitful way. Um, so we started with um, geometry, with Euclidean geometry, and deduced from this uh, the isometry group. Um, but this, so the new idea is that instead of deducing the isometry group from the geometry, we should reverse the arrow, um, and uh, we should make the group the central object and regard the geometric features as those features which are preserved by the action of um, the group elements. Um, so uh, this idea was introduced by Felix Klein over a hundred years ago, uh, and this approach to geometric structures is known as the Erlangen program after the university where Klein worked. So this point of view um, allows you to enlarge your idea of geometry to encompass any situation in which you have a group that are called G acting on a space X, and then the geometry consists of those properties of the space which are preserved by the group action. So uh, when the space is R2 and the group is uh, the semi-direct product that we have already seen, then we recover Euclidean geometry. Um, but now we can put this in a sort of a broader context and we can see several other interesting geometric structures. Um, if we enlarge the orthogonal group to the full general linear group of uh, invertible transformations. Um, then we get affine geometry um, in which uh, we can still define straight lines, but we no longer have a good notion of length or angle, but we do still have a good notion of parallel. Um, but so it turns out uh, that you can uh, think of this group as a subgroup of PGL3R uh, which acts on projective space. And uh, the Kleinian geometry defined in this setting is projective geometry. Uh, so all of these, of course, uh, you know, are, are very rich material for a course. Uh, there's one more that uh, can't resist mentioning. Uh, if the group is um, PSL2R um, and you look at its action on the upper half plane, then the geometry that is geometric structure that's preserved by this action is uh, hyperbolic geometry, the non-Euclidean hyperbolic geometry. Um, so there's uh, you know, clearly no end to how much can be said about uh, geometric structures from this point of view, um, but perhaps let's get back to the designs such as our Indebelli wall patterns. Um, so we've seen uh, that we can describe the symmetries <clears throat> of a design or a pattern as an invariance under specific isometries, but uh, we can go further and um, uh, take all the symmetries together and define a subgroup. Uh, so that would be a symmetry group for that design. Um, and so then in the, uh, the spirit of the Erlangen program, uh, you could perhaps uh, reverse this approach and ask what kind of subgroups can occur. And this becomes uh, especially interesting uh, if instead of considering all subgroups, we impose some constraints. Um, and one fi famous example of this approach leads to subgroups 
which can be symmetry groups for wallpaper patterns. There's repeating patterns which cover the entire plane. And uh, you know, there's a famous result show, which shows that there are precisely 17 possible wallpaper subgroups. Um, so this, again, this result could certainly be covered in a course, uh, but there's a, a simpler situation uh, in which so sort of many of these similar ideas can be seen and which ties in nicely with our examples. Uh, so the simplest uh, situation is illustrated by freeze patterns. So those are patterns confined to strips, um, such as uh, at the top and at the bottom of this in the Bailey house. Um, so these patterns, uh, these designs um, repeat in just one direction rather than two, like the wallpaper patterns. Uh, so this kind of pattern is also um, a big part of our next example of uh, an African decorative art, where we see the interplay between math and the art. So before we get to the math behind the, these freeze patterns, let me introduce this next example. Um, and so this is um, the patterns in um, basketry bags. So these bags come from a part of Mozambique um, where Tonga women have a strong tradition of basketry. Uh, so uh, see, Tonga is again a distinct language. It's a dialect of Tonga or Kitsonga, I think it's called. And the map shows the region where it's spoken and where the baskets can be found. Um, so before I say anything about this basketry, um, I should acknowledge um, how I learned of it. Um, and uh, this is from uh, the amazing work of ethnomathematician Paulus Gerdes. Um, so Professor Gerdes uh, was originally from Holland, but worked for many years in Mozambique and was really a pioneer in studying the interaction between mathematics and culture, especially African cultures. Uh, he was a prolific author uh, on this topic uh, and over several decades amassed uh, a vast collection of, of woven mats, bags, hats, and other items, including the basketry that I want to describe. Um, so really everything I say in all the pictures um, are from his work. Um, so I want to concentrate on just one aspect of these baskets, namely these freeze or strip patterns that appear on them. Um, so to make it easy to see the patterns, uh, it's perhaps you know, useful to suppress uh, details of the material that's used in the baskets, uh, the individual strands of grass or reed or whatever they're made from, and to just show the patterns. Uh, so that's what I've, we've done here. We've abstracted away the pattern from the basket. Um, so Professor Gerdes uh, collected and catalogued over 400 different unique designs like the ones in these pictures. Here's just uh, a small sample of uh, the many patterns in his collection. Um, so just like in the, uh, in the Bailey murals, there's obviously a, a high degree of symmetry in these patterns. Um, and we can describe the symmetry as before in terms of Euclidean isometries, which return the pattern to itself. Um, so let me just illustrate this uh, with a couple of examples. So here's one of the patterns, and you can see that if you rotate it around the X in the middle there, it returns to itself. Uh, it has another symmetry, a translation symmetry. If you slide along that arrow, the pattern returns to itself. Here's um, a slightly more complicated pattern that um, also has uh, this rotation symmetry and it has a translation. Um, but this one also has a couple other symmetries. Um, it's symmetric uh, about uh, a vertical line that I've shown there. So reflection in that line returns the pattern to itself. And it also has a glide reflection. If you slide along the hor horizontally along the line I've shown and then reflect, um, reflect about that line, the pattern you know, is returned to itself. Uh, so uh, you may wonder what other types of symmetry you can expect in these freeze patterns, or perhaps uh, you might ask the more ambitious question, can we class possible of freeze patterns? Um, so, uh, or, uh, okay, so, really, 
framed these two questions. Um, or in the more mathematical language, uh, you would ask which isometries, which elements in the group of Euclidean isometries preserve a freeze pattern uh, and what possible subgroups can they generate? Um, so it turns out um, that just like for wallpaper patterns, uh, mathematics can give us a complete answer, um, which uh, can not only be fairly easily described, but uh, there's a great opportunity to introduce uh, several useful group theoretic tools into a course. Um, so firstly, there are exactly five isometries which can be applied to a freeze. Um, there's the translation, glide reflection, rotation, a, vert a rotation through 180 degrees, um, a vertical reflection or a horizontal reflection. Um, all of these, all, all freeze patterns have to have a translation um, by a, a discrete amount, otherwise they wouldn't be freeze patterns. That's sort of the defining uh, characteristic really, um, but uh, they may or may not have any of these others. So you can now uh, try to build all possible freeze subgroups. Um, so it's useful here to introduce the idea of an extension of groups um, and to describe uh, the isometry group as an extension of the orthogonal group by the group of translations. Um, so then a, a freeze group will be an extension of a subgroup of the orthogonal group by a translation subgroup. Um, we already know that the translation part of the freeze subgroup has to basically be a copy of the integers. Um, and it's not too hard to see that uh, the quotient is a finite subgroup of the orthogonal group of order one, two, or four. Um, in this case, it turns out that this is really enough to determine all the possibilities. Um, and uh, the upshot is uh, the amazing theorem that there are exactly seven possible free subgroups. That is seven types of patterns which remain unchanged under the various possible combinations of the allowed symmetries. Um, so, I mean, we don't know whether the Tonga weavers were aware of this fact as a theorem, but uh, you can see from the examples that I've shown here that they definitely had discovered all seven possibilities. Um, so uh, depending on how much time you have in your course or uh, in a talk, I think we do have time now, uh, it's instructive at this point to compare the freeze subgroup to the possible wallpaper groups. Um, and, uh, and so these can be viewed uh, as extensions of finite order subgroup of the orthogonal group, again, by an infinite translation subgroup. But now the translations are in two directions for the wallpaper group. Uh, in fact, uh, so the translation part has to be a rank two lattice. And there are more possibilities for the, the, the uh, subgroup of the orthogonal group. Uh, but um, the list is still very restricted. Um, it turns out also that in this case, the interactions between the sub and the quotient group um, has a few more options than it did in the freeze subgroup case. Uh, and there are more low tech ways to proceed at this point, but uh, this is a nice opportunity to introduce uh, some group cohomology theory. The, uh, the interaction between the lattice and the um, discrete subgroup P is, can be described as an extension class, which is an element of a uh, second group cohomology, and so this is an opening to explore, you know, all sorts of interesting topics in that direction. Um, so there are, of course, uh, you know, wonderful illustrations um, of wallpaper subgroups, um, but rather than go down um, that road, uh, in the last few minutes, I want to turn to a somewhat different example of the interaction between mathematics and culture. Um, and this example comes from the culture of the Chokwe people, one of the distinct language groups in Central Africa. Uh, and while they're known for a generally strong artistic tradition, the aspect that I want to talk about um, has to do with a Chokwe tradition of sand drawings. Um, so these are called sona, and they're, and they're literally tracings in the sand. 
So here you see some examples shown either as um, photographs of actual sonar or reproduced as um, line tracings. Um, so to make these sonar drawings, uh, the drawer first lays out a grid of dots in the sand and then traces out with a finger a continuous path following a few basic rules. And the main rule is that you have to trace one continuous path without lifting your finger. Uh, and you have to trace the line as if you're following the path of a, a billiard ball uh, on a billiard table. So this means that whenever you encounter a boundary, the path bounces the way a ball would do, meaning that the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. Uh, so in billiards, the angle can be anything, but here the angles are always 45 degrees. And the other difference um, <clears throat> is that um, in the sonar, there can be virtual internal boundaries, um, mirrors placed at some of the grid spots, and this determines this type of pattern you can get. So these diagrams are traditionally made by Chakwa elders at social gatherings. And the drawing always accompanied by a story. For example, in the one that I've illustrated here, the story is about a hunter named Chipanda who went on a hunt taking the dog Kawa and caught a wild goat. Uh, upon returning to the village, uh, Chipanda divided the meat with Kalala, the dog's owner, but Kawa was left with just the bones. And after some time, Chipinda again asked for the services of the dog, but the dog Kawa refused to help him. He told Chipanda to take Kalala with him instead because it was with Kalala that he was accustomed to divide, to divide the meat. Um, anyway, so there are several aspects of these sonar drawings which have a mathematical flavor. Some have to do with symmetries of the grids or the end products. Um, but the one I want to show you takes us down a somewhat different mathematical road. Um, and I want to look at um, sonar drawings on uh, rectangular grids of dots. Um, so here I've got a three by four and a two by four grid. And uh, here we're tracing out uh, a typical sort of sonar pattern. I've borrowed a nifty little program written by a coder in New York named Wenki Lee to generate these diagrams. Um, so for the purposes of storytelling, it's important that uh, by the time the path closes up on itself, it encompasses all the dots in the grid. And so you can see here in these two grids, um, in the three by four pattern, uh, the path did indeed close up and encompass all the grids, but in the two by four, it didn't. To encompass all the dots, you need two separate paths. I've indicated one of them here in um, yellow, and purple. And so this raises the question, you know, what determines whether the path encompasses all the dots uh, or more precisely, uh, how many paths are needed to get them all. Um, and so the, um, the key to understanding the number of path components uh, comes from looking at the effect of adding or removing a square block like the one in the picture here. And the key thing here is that the square block has to share an entire side with the rest of the grid. So in this illustration, we have a two by six grid um, where two paths, one in yellow and one in orange in this case, are needed to encompass all the grids. Um, so to see the effect of removing this two by two grid, uh, let me look at one of the paths, uh, just the orange one. And you'll notice that when the path enters the square, and because it enters at a 45 degree angle and the box is square, it bounces around the square, touching each side just once before it returns to its entry point. So from the perspective of the rest of the grid, the effect is the same as if the square had been blocked off by a solid barrier along the shared edge and the path had simply bounced off this edge. So it, it looked like that. Uh, you know, alternatively, if initially the two by two square isn't there so that the path just bounces off the wall, then the effect of adding the square is simply to add an extra loop to the path starting at ending at the point where it entered the square. I mean, the yellow path is um, similarly unaffected by adding or removing the, the two by two square. So either way, the number of paths required to capture all the grid points is the same with or without this two by two square. So you can simplify the grid without changing the number of path components by removing these um, square parts to it. So this gives us uh, an algorithm for determining 
the number of path components required in a rectangular grid. The algorithm is simply remove squares until you're down to a remaining square, say n by n, and then the number of paths is that n. So here's a, an illustration with a five by 13 grid. So you can see we can chop off two five by five squares, leaving a three by five grid, and we can chop off a three by three that leaves us with a three by two grid, then we can chop off a two by two, and we can chop off one one by one. So in this case, we're down to a one by one uh, grid. So there's only one path needed for this. So I'm sure uh, many of you recognize this algorithm. So this is uh, exactly the Euclidean algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of two integers. So this was first described over 2000 years ago in uh, Euclid's Elements. Book seven, proposition two. Um, so of course, this is an irresistible invitation to insert some number theory in a course. Uh, it also gives the answer, of course, to the question about the number of lines needed uh, in a sonar diagram. If you have a grid with A rows and B columns, then the number of curves that you need is the greatest common divisor. So um, there are many other interesting examples, of course, where math and culture or math and decorative arts interact. Uh, and many aspects of this interaction are worth exploring and you probably each have your favorites. But so just to end, uh, let me go back to the allure of order and symmetry in art. Um, as with uh, anything, even good things can be overdone. Uh, in this case, the danger of too much order or symmetry was well captured by uh, one art historian uh, and critic who issued this caution that uh, delight lies somewhere between boredom and confusion. And anyway, that's, uh, I hope, uh, the sweet spot where I've left you now. So thanks very much. <laughs>